So we're going to jump in right to the text. So if you open your Bibles, uh, we're in Acts 15, which is where we were last week as well. Um, but there's a few verses at the end of Acts 15 that we didn't touch, and we're going we're gonna to kind of finish that up today. Uh, and it's uh, verse 36 is where we're going to start. And uh, these few verses are just going to kind of be key for us in the, in the message today and what this whole sermon is about. So Acts 15, verse 36 uh, I'm going to read this to you, and this is about two guys, Paul and Barnabas, uh, who have been uh, doing ministry together for a while. So let's see what's happening with them. Verse 36, after some time, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing. Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along John Mark. This is Mark, the author of the gospel of Mark, right? Um, which we'll hear later is also his, uh, Barnabas's cousin, as it's believed. Uh, verse 38, but Paul disagreed strongly since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. Their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas, and as he left, the believers entrusted him to the Lord's gracious care. Then he traveled throughout Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches there. Okay, so we've got these two guys. And what we just witnessed is a historic breakup, okay? Uh, these two guys who have done ministry together, who have worked together for a really, really long time. Uh, they have loved one another, supported one another. Uh, and in the beginning of this whole story, um, Barnabas um, was going around preaching the good news of, of Jesus. And he was called to go and get Paul from Tarsus and bring him into the ministry. After Paul had been radically saved, he'd experienced all the things that Jesus had for him and was jumping into it himself and preaching the good news. And so Barnabas brings him in. And then at Antioch, the believers... Uh, they go together, and this is where believers are first called Christians. It's just mighty things happening where these two guys do ministry. They're sent together to Jerusalem at one point to help bring relief during a famine. They go back to Antioch, and at this point in chapter 12, verses 11 through 15, are where we're going to see a lot of Barnabas and Paul doing ministry. But in chapter 12, John Mark, Mark comes into the equation, and he's kind of like an assistant to them in their ministry. Uh, and then they're later both called and commissioned together by the Holy Spirit, and uh, they begin traveling and preaching the good news. And as they do that, they preach powerful messages. God uses them to perform miracles. They're leading people to Jesus. They're getting chased out of towns together. It's a great thing, right? They argue vehemently, like Tanner said last week, just with people about the truth of God, you know, just a wonderful time. And they're bringing clarity to the word, right? So that people understand what God is speaking and, and knowing. And so they're doing this together. Uh, and uh, again, Mark is with them. And so back to, back to the text, they decide to disagree on this. Barnabas is like, let's bring Mark as we go back and check on these churches. And Paul is like, no way, right? Why the split? All because of one guy named Mark, again, who is believed to be Barnabas's cousin. And he shows up first in chapter 12. He's like their assistant, but he deserts them is what it says, right? So in verse 13, that's where this happens. It says in verse five, in, verse, in chapter 13, excuse me, verse five, it says, John Mark went with them as their assistant. So he's with them, he's serving them. And then you go down uh, in between verses five and 13, they experience uh, uh, stuff with Bar Jesus. You remember we talked about Bar Jesus and uh, him being uh, the sorcerer and the false prophet. And so you get to verse 13, eight verses later, and it says, Paul and his companions then left Paphos by ship for Pamphylia, landing at the port town of Perga. There, John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. Right? It's like eight verses later, the dude's like, I'm out. I'm done with this whole thing. I'm heading back to Jerusalem where I'm from. And so this is what Paul is upset about. But why was the disagreement so sharp? The honest answer, we can't say for sure. It's just the truth. You know those moments in scripture where you read and you're like, this, I don't know. You know what I mean? I would like to know answers. I would like to have information just to back up and say, this is exactly why this happened and, and how A plus B equals C and all that, right? You're like, that doesn't make sense. But that's what we want, right? We want answers. We want clarity. And sometimes we just don't have all the details that we would like, right? And so the reality is there's lots of questions that are left unanswered uh, by Luke in this passage. And so over years, the church and theologians and, and people have brought forward ideas and assumptions to kind of fill in the gaps. Why was the disagreement so sharp? Why was it so sharp that they ended up splitting, that they chose to divide rather than stay unified in their ministry? So let me give you some potentials, okay? Again, these are not facts, but it's kind of cool to dig into the words sometimes and go, what are the potential reasons that we could dig into and see why people are responding the way they are in scripture? So for Paul, what are some of the potentials as to why Paul is so headstrong and no, we cannot bring along Mark, right? Maybe 
It stems from an idea like we find in, in Luke 9:62. It says, but Jesus told them, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. This is an intense verse. It's a real thing, right? Someone who says, I'm in, and then goes, just kidding. It's like, hold on. That can't be it, right? So it's like, I cannot take somebody with me that is not going to fulfill the calling that God has placed. If they're going to turn around and back out, that's a risk. And Paul knows the work he is doing is a big deal. He wants people who are committed to spreading the gospel of Jesus, not someone he has to worry about, somebody who's going to be a risk and and somebody who's not going to be reliable and who's going to turn around and leave the work that God has called them to. So maybe, just maybe, that's what's going on in Paul's mind, right? But then you got Barnabas. And if you know about Barnabas, his name translated actually means the son of encouragement, right? So you got this guy who's an encourager, and you've got this guy who, this is his cousin. And so maybe what he's hoping to do is just give his cousin another chance, right? Because isn't that what Jesus does for us Amen. all the time, right? And so maybe, just maybe, you got Barnabas here thinking about people like Peter. So we know Peter, Peter who followed Jesus, who was told that he would deny Jesus three times, said, no, I won't, and then denied Jesus three times, right? And yet, on the shore, Jesus says, upon you, I will build my church. You will be my rock. And so Barnabas, looking at Mark, maybe he goes, well, Peter got this grace. Peter got another chance. If Peter, why not Mark? Why not Mark, right? So again, just maybe. Ultimately, we don't have the facts for sure. And it wouldn't be accurate or fair to assume, to the text and to the word, to assume the missing details that as facts based on ideas and opinions, but just maybe this is what's going on in these guys' hearts. This is what led them to feel um, so, uh, that this situation was so, so, so important. But here's what I think we actually need to focus on. What do we do with this passage? I think the fact that details are left out by Luke is actually so important for us to recognize. I think the lack of those details is not what we focus in on, uh, or what the details are, excuse me, is what we focus in on, but we focus on the lack of detail intentionally as it, as it focuses in on the whole story. Because what we have here is two early church leaders, heroes of the faith early on, who mess up big time. That's what's happening here, right? Maybe you've heard otherwise. And again, as I was studying and reading, there were theologians and people who I was reading from commentaries and they were like, this person's right. No, this person was right. And here's what God was doing. Because if you go on, God takes these two guys who go different ways and he does a mighty work through both of them, right? Like God takes them and, and Paul and Silas, they go do some great things and spread the good news of Jesus. Jews and Gentiles are being reached, right? And Barnabas, they go the other way. And the same thing happens. God uses both. More people are reached for the good news of Jesus. That's a win, Amen. That's a big deal. But is that not just God being God? Did God need somebody to make a mistake so that he can do a good work? I don't know a God that does that, right? That needs that. He does that, a God that needs that. My God comes in and he says, I can take the worst of situations, the most broken of of situations and do the greatest of things. And so we see that with these two, but did he need them to be broken? Did he need them to disagree so that he could do a good thing? Or is that just simply who our God is? Is that he brings good always, even when we get in the way? Because these two guys got in the way. They let their opinions, their ideas, their, their beliefs on what was right get in the way. But God came in and did a mighty work. So what do we do then? How do we see this? We need to see this as, as just one simple thing. This is a loss of unity. This moment with excuse me, with these two guys, these two heroes of the faith is a loss of unity. And we have to recognize it for the sake of truth. And ultimately, because we too are like Paul and Barnabas. We too walk through moments and seasons where there is a loss of unity between us and another person, between us and a group of people. We choose our way, our opinion, our idea, and we run with it. And we set aside the importance of unity in relationship, the importance of loving one another, of doing life and ministry together like God has called us to because of what we think is right. Let's think about it, right? When we get into conflict and what culture tells us all the time is we split. When things go south, we just go the opposite way. Just like these two guys, we disagree, we split. Cancel culture, right? We've talked about it for a few years now pretty frequently, but it's such a big deal, There's little to no room for error in our world today. 
If you make a mistake, it doesn't matter all the things that you've done, the things that you've done well for the Lord or anything like that. And again, I'm not making excuses for things to be swept under the rug. Accountability is a thing and we need to be held accountable for our actions, amen. But part of what we do is with those people who maybe we disagree with or we don't see eye to eye with, after we make this, we we get a little bit on the other side of each other, we cancel them. So we're done. I'm done with this relationship. I don't need this relationship. We lack grace for one another. And like I said, there's no room for error. So why is it that we naturally lean into to the split? Rather than fighting for unity, why is it so easy for us to lean into separation and division? I think there's a few lies that float around in our mind, in our minds that, that convince us of this. The first one is, I'm right. Come on. So I asked first service, I was like, how many of us like it when we're right? Like two people raised their hands. I was like, so we got to talk about the truth now. We can't be lying in church, right? I like to be right. I'm, I mean, I'll just be real. It feels good when you're right. I mean, uh, for my married people in the room, you know, when you get into an argument, you're going back and forth and you start to recognize, dang, I might win this one. (laughs) I feel kind of good. You know what I mean? I think I'm right. It feels good, right? But you know that it really doesn't matter at the end of the day. I was right. Enjoy the couch. (laughs) Right? Who really wins in that? Nobody. But I'm right. We want to be right so bad. So to be right, what I'd rather do, because being right is so important to me, is I would separate myself from those who tell me I'm wrong or disagree with me. And I'm going to go to my own little echo chamber so I can hear I'm right, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. Right? I just want it echoed. I want to hear it all over and over again. So I'm going to surround myself with people who tell me you're right, because I think I'm, that's right too. I'm going, to, I'm going to surround myself with people who act and think and say like I do, because that's what I want. Because that's comfortable, that's easy, that's good. But is it what I need? Right? I'm right, and I want to be told I'm right. So I will fill my space, my life, my world with those people who agree with that. The echo chamber will say I'm right. But they become dangerous, these other things that I surround myself with. Because what they're based on is an an impression and an idea that my opinion is 100% truth and fact and accurate. But I've ever stopped to ask the question, am I wrong? Because if I am, not only am I, but the people around me are going to end up so much more hurt. It's such a dangerous place to be. So I'm right. Maybe for you, it's everything is a big issue, right? Everything is a big issue. Everything is something that I'm willing to die on a hill for. You ever been in that space where you just like, maybe you're with somebody and it's like, and they've got an opinion about everything. And they get hype about every single thing. Our kids, uh, Liam and Ellie, there's times, they're great kids, y'all. Let me tell you, I love my kids. But there are times between them that everything means war. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, Liam, don't close the door that way. You know what I mean? He's like, Ellie, you left your shoe. You know what I mean? It's like, any, stop breathing like that. It's like, why are you guys getting so mad, right? Over the smallest things. They're just, they'll, they'll find things like, don't pour your cereal that way. You know what I mean? It's like, what are we so upset about? Because sometimes we feel like we've got to have an opinion, a feeling about everything. Everything's got to be a big deal. But what does that do for me? Except stress me out. Except cause frustration and division in my mind towards somebody else. It doesn't help me. Again, our kids are great, but don't we do this? I've got to say, I don't know about that. Honestly, I don't even know how I feel about that, but I'm going to say I feel about it. Because everything is an opinion, or I have an opinion on every single thing. It's a big issue to me. Or maybe, maybe it's just you've been hurt. Maybe it's just you've been so hurt, and it feels like the person that hurt you, the people who have disagreed with you, where the conflict lies, whoever that is with, they've messed up too much. The mess they've made is too big for me to circle back with them and try to make things right. So what's the issue with these lies When we believe these lies, when we lean into them, people get hurt. Someone is left bitter. Someone is left with with an unhealthy expectation of another person or of each other. Maybe an unhealthy expectation of, of God himself. Someone has placed themselves on a pedestal. Someone is left isolated. People are left dwelling in brokenness, looking for a source of healing outside of the name of Jesus. So I have a, uh, uh, there's a family member, and I'm not going to tell you who they are or anything like that, their relationship, just to protect their story and to, to honor them in this. But um, there was another member of our family who, who made some choices that really upset them, they disagreed with. Um, yeah, they, they, 
big division was created. So much so that this family member, when they talk about that other family member, they tell people that that person is dead. Not just dead to them, you know, but like physically they go, oh, we're like, what about them? We're like, oh, they're not alive anymore. They passed away. Can you hear the brokenness in those words? And again, that's, it, there's got to be an understanding, right? Compassion for, for the hurt that this, this family member is feeling. They were so hurt that they went that far. And it breaks our heart. But we know that that's not a place where you find healing. That that is too far, right? That there's, there's something there that God needs to come in and restore. And that when we get restoration, when we're deciding to fight for unity with Jesus and we work towards forgiveness, that that's where real healing happens. That there's more joy found in that, that, that this place that this family member's in is just, it's just numb and God doesn't call us to numb and to emptiness. Can we just be honest about what, what's happening in our world right now? An assassination attempt on a former president. And we're not here to, to, to discuss the, the political sides and who's right and who's wrong and all that, but to take the life of somebody else or to attempt to, we've degraded a human being that God created and said they are not worthy, they are not valuable, and in no way, shape, or form, no matter how much we disagree, has God ever called us to that. No way. Church, can we, let's take a second, can we pray together for the, for the division in our nation, for, for the, the, the pain, the, the hurt that's come to a place where we are where we are right now. And we can agree that unity is needed, amen? amen. Reconciliation amongst brothers and sisters is needed, amen? amen? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, God. And Lord, we're, we live in a, a wild, wild time. Jesus, we need you. It doesn't matter where we fall, what side we, we land on, Jesus. We just need you. Be our everything. Be our priority, God. What it, whatever you have, God. We want your way, God. We want to love one another. Help us to set differences aside, Lord, to see the value of human life, God, to see the value of the people you've created, even if we don't agree with them, God. They're your creation, God. We all are your creation. We all bear the image of God. Let us love one another in that way, from that place alone, Jesus. We need you. We love you. Help us, Lord. Help us to be a light in our communities, in our friendships, in our circles, God, to push unity, to push reconciliation, to push love, Jesus, to not focus only on the differences and the lies of what we think is right and what is wrong. We need you, Jesus. We love you. Can you name me pray? Amen. A picture of a broken world, amen? Yes. We need Jesus. We, we, we need his way. And so what is his way? Like we just said, it is, it is unity. 1 Corinthians 1.10, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Amen. Live in harmony together, right? So we might not agree, but we can still make beautiful music. That's how I see it, right? We can, right? Like I love being here and hearing people worship. And like when you've got worship leaders who, who have different voices and they, I mean, we got a great worship team, amen. Can we make some noise for our worship team? Let's go. Praise God. Come on, brother. But when people come in and they got different voices and they harmonize, right? Because they're singing a different, I don't even know how to use these words, keys, pitches, I don't know. They're singing different, okay? But it sounds like it, all, it was always made to go together. It sounds beautiful. It flows so well. And that, that's just a beautiful thing. And I think it's a beautiful picture of how we're called to be is we're going to come in with differences and, and different ideas and beliefs and opinions and all that. And God says, let those be minor and let me be major. Let those be minor and let who I've called you to be, what I have for you be major. Lean into me and me alone and you will make beautiful music with those I've called you to do life with. Yes. Things will be good, but you've got to trust me. Be in unity with one another. Walk with one another, Right? Be in harmony. I love that. And this isn't, a, this isn't some, some new idea, right? This has, been, this has been from the very beginning, the heart of the Father for us people. Psalms 133 says, How wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. For harmony is as precious as the anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head that ran down his beard and onto the border of his robe. Harmony is, is as refreshing as the dew from Mount Hermon that falls in the mountains of Zion. And there the Lord has pronounced his blessing, even life everlasting. 
This is David talking about the, the need for unity amongst God's people and, and, and the beauty that comes when we decide to do that. That's a, that's a three-verse chapter, right? That's a powerhouse, right? Word to Kevin in the office. Why waste time stay lot word, you know? You know what I'm saying? Just a beat. Yeah, that was, yeah, unscripted. I don't know. If you know the office, you know, okay. But the unity is mandatory. God wants it. He says, this is the only way to health. This is the only way to, to, to goodness, to what I've actually got for you. Because when you go your way, oh, the pain that comes. The lack of importance on one another that comes. All throughout scripture, we see God's heart for us to be unified, to set aside the differences we sometimes struggle with, to let go of them and to come together and let God use us to make beautiful music, literally and metaphorically, right? To be in harmony. So here's the reality though. Like we said, we are Peter, or sorry, so we are Paul and Barnabas and Peter sometimes, you know. We split, we go our own ways. So when we do that, where do we go? What do we do? When we've set aside unity and we've, we, we've chosen to go with division instead and separation, is that it? No. God calls us to get back in step. God says, be reconciled. Matthew 5, 23 through 24. Jesus says this. He says, if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. So he's like, hey, you're worshiping me, right? Because that's what they're doing. When they talk about these sacrifices and placing them on the altar, you're giving God praise. You're worshiping him. You're sacrificing to God the Father. And he's like, I love your worship. God loves our worship, amen? And it's a good thing and God calls us to it, amen? So he's like, that's great, worship. But also, if you have not been reconciled and there is a broken relationship, go fix that, then come back and worship. Do you see the emphasis that Jesus places on reconciliation, on fighting for unity, on seeking out unity amongst one another? And it's, it's, it doesn't stop there, right? Jesus constantly puts major emphasis on our need to reconcile with one another when we've, when we've broken unity, when we've messed up with unity like Paul and Barnabas. Matthew 6, 14 through 15 says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive your sins. Amen. That's the tough verse. Like Jesus coming in like, yeah, yeah. If you forgive, you'll be forgiven. If you don't, you won't. Wait, 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 what? I thought I was, I thought we were good. Jesus, I thought, you know, we made everything right. He's like, hold on now. Have you checked your heart? Because I don't know about you guys, but what we should experience when we receive the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of Jesus is this overwhelming joy and feeling that everybody else in the world deserves this too. That everybody else deserves mercy and grace and forgiveness, not just from Jesus, but from us, because it's what he did for me and I didn't deserve it. I didn't earn a piece of it and he gave it to me. In fact, I still sometimes keep pushing it away and he keeps giving it. And so now I'm called to make sure that other people get that too. And I want to, that's the work of the Holy Spirit within me. He said, I I want to, I want you to want to give people grace and mercy and forgiveness. That's the evidence of the Holy Spirit. That's the evidence of Jesus in us and the understanding of what he's done. We want other people to experience the same thing. We need to be reconciled. We have to get back in step, right? So I, I'm going to try something, and I, I did a first service, and it was okay. Probably give myself a B minus, but for all my military people in here, my soldiers, you guys have to march in formation sometimes. You're like, oh, no. Yeah. So if you get out of step, you have to do this thing. I believe it's called a change step march, okay? I talked to two soldiers. They told me that's what it's called. So if I'm wrong, blame them. <laughs> but what it is, you're in formation. You get out of step, change step march. I'm going to try it. You guys ready for this? Don't judge me, right? So you're walking and you get out of step, you do a little yip, skip it and go. You know what I'm saying? We try it again. You go back, you're out of step, a little whoop, there you go. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. No, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Justin, did I do it? Let's go. He was one of them. No. <laughs> so change step march, get back in step. I've decided to put unity aside, Lord, and I've chosen separation. He's like, hey, that's wrong, but it's okay. You can get back in step. You can be reconciled. Unity can still be the priority. You can still have that. Things may look a little different, amen, because we know that God doesn't just say, hey, be unified. And that means be okay with the hurt, be okay with the brokenness. No, no, no. He's saying things may need to have boundaries. Relationships may need to change a little bit to protect health, protect what God's totally and actually called us to. But you can still have unity. You can still be back in step with what God has for you. We gotta stay in step. 
That's what Jesus wants for us. And I, I love this. The reconciliation is so evident, too, in this situation with Paul and Mark specifically. In 2 Timothy 4.11, uh, at the end of his letter to Timothy, this is what he says. He says, only Luke is with me. Bring Mark with you when you come, for he will be helpful to me in my ministry. This is the same guy who at the beginning of this, we just, he got so mad that he allowed, this, he allowed some separation to happen between him and this guy he's done so much ministry with because of one guy. And now we see he went from, I can't and I won't do ministry with Mark to, hey, he's super helpful. I would love to do ministry with him. Yeah. So something has happened in this space, reconciliation. God has brought reconciliation between Paul and his feelings about Mark and him and Mark. And, and now they desire to do ministry together and, and, and to spread the good news together. The book of, of Philemon even mentions them later in, in years of ministry together, doing ministry together. Because that's what God does. If we let him, he reconciles the things that we've broken and, and, and separated and divided. And he helps us to get back in step like he helped Paul to get back in step with Mark. And this is what Jesus wants for us. He understands the damaging weight that choosing to not forgive brings, not just to others, but to us, to our own hearts, to our own souls. When we carry that around, we don't surrender it to him. So there was a season, um, my mom and I went through a crazy season of not seeing eye to eye at all. It was right after I graduated from high school or right around there, somewhere around there. And uh, we just could not agree. I, could not, I, I was struggling to agree with choices she was making. She was disagreeing with me on things. And, and, and truthfully, our relationship just kind of started to, to crumble and fall apart. And uh, it got to a place where we were getting comfortable with the separation of relationship, with, with the lack of unity, to where we weren't really talking to each other a lot. And we were, we, I was getting okay with it. I was like, yep, I'm cool. I guess I'm not just gonna, I guess I'm just not going to talk to my mom much. And uh, ultimately, God was God and came in and was like, that's not how this works. And he pushed me and pushed me and, you know, encouraged me. You need to talk to your mom. I was like, I don't want to, you know. I'm mad. But he kept pushing me, kept pushing me. And eventually my mom and I ended up having a conversation and um, we worked through it. We got back in step. And like I said, things looked different. They had to for the health of our relationship. But, but God brought reconciliation to, to our relationship. And I look back at it now and there was forgiveness and grace and mercy and all of it. And um, it's crazy because... We reconciled, and not long after that, my mom went home to be with Jesus. And it's like, man, I, I, I can't thank God enough because I could have missed out on reconciliation with my mom before she went home. And that's just the kindness of God to nudge us to what he knows what we need, man. He just wants to give us good things. And he's like, come on, you need this. I promise you, I won't let you down. Trust me in this, trust me in this. And he, he proved it. And I'm so thankful to him for that. He's so kind to me for that. So here's what this is not, right? Just as a reminder, this is not some call to t total affirmation or acceptance of, of everybody's different differences and what they think and how they are, right? When it comes to unity, people are going to have different ideas. To be in unity, you don't have to accept their ideas as truth, but they can still be family. We can still give love, right? And when it comes to reconciliation, in no way, shape, or form is it a call to sweep the hurt or the pain we experience under the rug, and to go, oh, this is, you just get over it. No, that's not the heart of the Father. Here's the heart of the Father. Psalm 34, 18 says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. Amen. God cares for us. He loves us so much, right? And he cares for us so much that he wants good things for us. He wants the best things for us. Psalm 103. If you ever had read through the book of Psalm, you're doing it today, man. I'll tell you all these. Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5. Let all that I am praise the Lord with my whole heart. I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. Amen. He understands that this process will be different for each of us and may take longer for a lot of us, right? And that's okay. He wants health for us. He wants healing for us. He wants good things for us. What's absolutely best, and it may look very different. It may take a lot of different time, but he's willing to be patient with us and to help us through it. So there's a, a situation that happened, uh, I want to say like five or six years ago. It was, it was a while back between a man uh, named Brant Jean and a lady named Amber Geyer. Some of you may notice it by the names, but um, long story short, there was a police officer, Miss Amber Geyer, um, and she was uh, heading home to her apartment. Um, when she walked into her apartment, there was a man in there, um, and she thought he was an intruder, and she shot and killed him. Um, come to find out, 
she entered the wrong apartment and she took this man's life. She thought it was hers, but she took his life. So she went on trial, um, was found guilty. And um, in that court hearing, his brother, Brant, was there and got on the stand and he shocked the world because when he got on the stand, instead of saying, I can't believe you took my brother, I won't forgive you for what you've done. He said words like, hey, I love you. I don't even want you to go to jail. I forgive you. I forgive you. If my brother was here, he would say the same thing to you. That's miraculous. That is the work of God in somebody's heart, right? He got off the stand. He asked the judge, can I give her a hug? And the judge was silent. He said again, can I give her a hug? And he got off the stand and he gave this woman who took her, his brother's life a hug. And he invited her into a relationship with Jesus. He encouraged her in it, told her how much God loved her. That's different. And let me tell you, church, we're called to different. Yeah. 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 We're called to be like Brant, to be used by God in a mighty way. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 says, therefore go out from their midst, from the midst of all those who are of the world until you separate, be away from, you know, split. If somebody makes you mad, d be in division, right? Therefore go out from their midst and separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, then I will welcome you. This is not the call of separation and division. It's a call to be different from the rest of the world, to be a light for Jesus, to stand out amongst the rest of the world who's doing things a certain way and to say, no, I'm gonna do it God's way. When somebody takes another life, I'm not gonna hate them for it. I'm gonna say, God forgives you. I forgive you. I love you. And I want good things for you. Man, that's impossible, huh? But isn't it a good thing that we've got the God who can do all things on our side? And he says, man, I wanna heal your heart so that you can be like Brant. You can sit on the stand and go, I love you. Even though I'm hurt, even though we disagree, even though there's, there's conflict and issue, I love you and I forgive you. This is where we're called to be to separate ourselves from the other ways and to be like Jesus. Amen. It calls us to good things, to go his way, because again, he knows the weight of unforgiveness. He knows what it looks like when we choose division and nothing but hurt comes from that. Yeah. We need to go God's way. Okay, four more things. And I just, let me just say this real quick. I forgot to do this at the beginning. We're talking about unity and all this kind of stuff. Y'all remember his name is Jesus, right? Can we invite uh, Eli and Sheridan Garcia, the pastors of the church who are here from his name in Jesus? I was supposed to do this way earlier. Are we just talking about unity, right? And it's like, this is unity amongst churches. Let's show up and let's do church together. Let's be family. Let's put aside the differences. We've been talking about that a lot, but praise God that you guys are here today. We're super excited to have y'all with us, man. Praise God. Sorry I didn't do it at the beginning. I got four things before we finish. Four things, just quick things I want to re just remind you of. Because again, this is hard. And again, we have a God who is understanding, Right? We have a God who understands the struggle of us being human and being broken and how easy it is to lean into that. And he's not mad at us. He just wants better for us. So four things that I think can help us as we fight toward unity and reconciliation. First thing, we have to destroy all pedestals but one. Psalm 118 verses 8 through 9. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in people. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. We place other people, including ourselves, and our own opinions or their opinions and their ideas on pedestals, right? We hold them to a higher standard. What we should be doing is making sure that the voice of God reigns king over all. Amen. That his voice is the authority. His voice is the only truth. Because the reality is, is people will let us down. And so if we're clinging to opinions that are based on ideas or, 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 or thoughts of men, we will be let down. We will experience such heartbreak over and over and over again, which can lead to confusion and hurt and so many other things that God has not called us to be involved in. So he says, put your trust in me. Let me be the only one who is this high on your life, who is up here and who reigns as a voice of truth. Just him and him alone, right? My son Liam and I were, uh, were going, we're, it's just a beautiful time. We're going through a lot of the uh, Marvel movies, right? Praise God for the MCU. Um, and uh, Again, he's, he's, he's younger. You're like, wait. And I'm like, hey, we skipped some parts. He's like, why'd you skip that? I'm like, don't worry about it. And uh, keep watching it. But we watched Iron Man 3 the other day. And at the beginning of the movie, there's this scene where Tony Stark, it's like back in the 90s and it's before he's Iron Man. And if you know much about him, he was really a good dude. He like, it's kind of a bad dude before all this, right? And so he's got this other guy 
Um, and uh, he comes up to him with an idea. And the guy's like, hey, I have an idea. This guy ends up being the villain in the movie. He's like, will you hear me out, Mr. Stark? I think it could be a, like revolutionary. I think it'd be really cool. And he's like, Tony Stark's like, yeah, I'll hear your idea. I'll meet you on the roof in like 10 minutes and we'll talk through your idea and make something happen. He was lying and he never went to meet the guy on the roof in the movie, right? And the guy's standing up there in the cold just waiting for Tony Stark. So Liam watches this and he's like, wait, why would Iron Man do that? And I'm like, well... People are kind of trash sometimes. We're broken, right? And it was, it, I mean, I praise God for it. It was a great moment to talk to my son about how we, we are imperfect human beings who will fail. Now, does that, does that mean that God can't get us back on track into bigger and better things? This man became Iron Man. You know what I'm saying? And I was like, Liam, isn't it cool to see where he, where he went to, though? And how he loved people after that? And he was like, yeah. You know what I mean? Doesn't God want to do that with us? We've got to place trust in, in, in him, Right? We can't keep placing each other on these pedestals because we will fail each other. We can believe good things for one another. We can, we can have hopes for good things for one another, but the only person whose voice is the loudest is God's, right? So that we're not placing opinions in places they never belonged, attached to people who never had the right to hold them. It's just God and God alone. Second thing, we have to sit with difference. Proverbs fourteen twelve says, there is a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. Just straight up. We oftentimes think that we know what we're doing and that what we're doing is right, but we're wrong, right? Like we said, we got the echo chamber going and we need to get out of it because we aren't always right. It's a huge call to humility and to being a teachable person, right? If it's comfortable and known, those usually aren't words that are associated with growth from God. He's like, you gotta, you gotta have some opposition that comes in that pushes against you a little bit, all for the goal of helping you, Right? Like, we got to see that opposition. It's, it, we, we look at it as a negative thing completely, but I believe God can use the opposition of other people in our lives to bring health, to bring good things, to, bring, to be used to create unity, right? Um, there's a, I'm, I'm jumping forward, I'm breaking the rules, but there's a, a chapter, Acts 18. We've got two people, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, and uh, they're these just powerhouse leaders in the church and this powerhouse couple, right? And they have this moment where there's a guy named Apollos in their community, and he's teaching about Jesus. He's been taught about Jesus, and so now he's doing it. Well, they listen to him teach, and in this, in this moment, they realize that what he's preaching is not 100% accurate. They're like, ah, this guy actually is not teaching the right thing all the way. And so here's what they do in verse 26, right? When Priscilla and Aquila heard him preaching boldly in the synagogue, they took him aside and explained the way of God even more accurately. Right? So they come in, and if you're Apollos, we have a tendency, if somebody comes and brings an idea of like, you're wrong, you're gonna be like, who's wrong? You know what I mean? Not me and defensiveness and all that kind of stuff. They took him aside and they're like, hey, here's, here's some truth. They don't shame him in front of other people. You don't know what you're talking about. Nothing like that, right? They're like, hey, we're coming in because we want to help. And here's what happens in the next two verses. Because Apollos had been thinking about going to Achaia and the brothers and sisters in Ephesus encouraged him to go. They wrote to the believers in Achaia asking them to welcome him. When he arrived there, he proved to be of great benefit to those who by God's grace had believed. He refuted the Jews with powerful arguments in public debate. Using the scriptures, he explained to them that Jesus was the Messiah. And this is a picture of that. You got people who come in and they can feel like opposition. Their ideas are gonna be different than yours, but they came together and said, hey, we might not see eye to eye, but hear us out on this and let's be unified as you move forward. And God did a mighty work through this man to receive the opposition, to receive a different idea than what he was used to and say, maybe I just need to learn something new. Maybe what I thought was right was not right after all. What a superpower that is to be teachable. And we need it, right? We have to let our opinions stay opinions and stop crowbarring them into facts because it feels comfortable, it feels good, it feels right, it feels known. God has never called us to those things. He calls us to trust him, to learn and to grow, to be changed by him. And so we have to lean into that. Some discomfort, some opposition is necessary, some difference is called to be sat with. Number three, we gotta get back to what matters most. 1 Corinthians 13, one through three. If I could speak all the languages of earth and angels and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. We get back to what matters most. We get back to loving each other. 
So when I enter a situation and it feels like there's some diff- differing opinions and ideas going on there and I'm getting ready to respond, I should pause and go, all right, with my response is love being lost. Is love being lost in how I approach this person, these people? Am I, am I placing love and loving them and caring for them in unity above my own right, my own desire, my own hope and opinion of what happens here? Are they above myself in this? Can I love them the right way? I mean, how much does Jesus push love, right? Over and over and over as the greatest commandment as everything. There's no greater love than to lay down one's life for a friend. Like, it's just like, love your enemies, all that, like over and over, love, love, love. Get back to what matters most. Get back to what matters most. God loved a world that did not love him back and he still loved. We have to get back to love. And love doesn't mean a, a setting aside of truth, right? Real love expresses truth like, like Priscilla and Aquila in a, in, a, in a gracious and kind way that simply just wants what's best and will work with somebody and walk through it with them to love them and see what's best, see God move, see the Holy Spirit, change them. We gotta get back to what matters most. Fourth and final thing, we have to belong to the Lord. Romans 14 verses five through nine says, in the same way, some think one day is more holy than another day while others think every day is alike. You should each be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. Those who worship the Lord on a special day do it to honor him. Those who eat any kind of food do so to honor the Lord, since they give thanks to God before eating. And those who refuse to eat certain foods also want to please the Lord and give thanks to God. For if we don't live for ourselves or die for, for we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, it's to honor the Lord. And if we die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose, to be, to be Lord both of the living and of the dead. Amen. We are called to belong to the Lord. So God says, hey, come in and bring your ideas. Come in and bring your, your feelings, your convictions, whatever it is, all the things that you feel strongly about, all of them, and submit them to me. Yeah. Belong to me. You do not belong to yourself when you say Jesus is Lord. You belong to Jesus. So we're called to do that, to get back to this place and go, all right, Lord, here's how I feel about this. Here's what I think about this. And to go, but ultimately your will be done. Amen. Here's what I feel is right, God. But, but truthfully, I have no idea what is right. Only you do. So show me what's right, God. God, I want unity. God, I want reconciliation where I failed in unity, God. I, I, I want to be back in step, Lord. So I, I won't cling to my ideas, God. I won't cling to myself. I won't belong to myself. I will belong to you and to you alone. In whatever way you say I need to live and however you say I need to speak and whatever way I need to love, Jesus, I will love that way. But it only happens if we go back and say, I belong to you. Every thought, every word, every way of life, I belong to you. Imagine if Paul and Barnabas in this whole situation decided, all right, we, diff- we have different opinions on Mark. What if we prayed for the next day? What if we went to God and said, all right, Lord, we, we can't see eye to eye. Help us. Because ultimately, we both belong to you. Ultimately, Mark belongs to you. So you'll show us, you'll show the people who belong to you which way to go. And just maybe, maybe there could have been unity in a different way that day. Just maybe They could have stayed in step with what God had for them. Again, praise God that no matter what we do, we can't get in the way of his grace and his kindness and of his power and of his move of his son Jesus across the world, right? God will move no matter what. But maybe we could have pleased the Lord in our unity and things could have been a little different if we say, I belong to the Lord. Amen? You guys want to stand up? We're going to pray together. Jesus, we thank you again um, for today, for this time. God, there's so much division in our world. There's so many different ideas, and and we've talked about it all, God. Moments of heartbreak that we see on the news, on social media, in our own lives, in our own families and circles, God, just brokenness and division and and hate and, and all these things that we were never called to get into, Jesus. It's us. We lean into them, God, and we we let things get to just a bad place. But I'm so thankful that the deepest and darkest place, Lord, you, you can get there. You can meet us there and bring us back. That you can save us and heal us and restore us. God, you can, you can bring health to this world. 
to this nation and every nation, Jesus. You, you can be a light. You are a light. So God, I pray for unity in every single heart. God, I pray for unity, a desire for it. God, a longing for it, Lord. Even when we don't get it right, God, let us not just be tired of it or push it to the side or, or expect that we can't achieve it, God, but to know that you are with us. And if we give you a chance, you will grow it. You will grow it and it will flourish into something beautiful, God. So we will, we will want to be unified with people more than anything else, Jesus. We want to represent you well in how we love each other, Lord. And if we've messed up, God, give us the boldness to step back into reconciliation, Jesus. To seek it out, Lord. To get back in step with what you've called us to do. God, we thank you for your grace for us. Yeah. We, don't, we, we don't even understand how big it is, Lord. That's the truth. But let us feel the weight of it in such a beautiful way, God. In such a beautiful way that we can't help but share it with those around us. That we can't help but give the grace given to us by Jesus Christ to the people that we might not see eye to eye with. <clears throat> to the people that we might not like. To the people that we maybe even said we hate, Jesus. That we may show them grace and love. Because you showed us first. You are good, God. You are good. Let the world know that we are who we are by how we love Jesus. You are so good. It's in your perfect and powerful name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. We're gonna